Hey everyone, it's Robby here with Rob D, and you are listening to the Property Podcast, and we have a very special episode this week. Finally, Rob D is announcing his new book. The title will come, but more important than just revealing the title is the fact that he will teach in this episode the type of investing you need to do to become rich. Welcome to the Property Podcast. Thank you for joining us. In case you don't know, we run a company that buys more than £100 million worth of property every year on behalf of our clients. You can find out about that at propertyhub.net slash invest. And while that takes up my weeks, at weekends, I write books. What can I say? I've got a six-year-old and a two-year-old. I need an excuse to get away. So in this episode, I'm going to share what this next book is about. And you're going to learn not just how people tell you to get rich, but how people actually get rich. It's time for our new story of the week. And following on from last week's market update, and if you've not listened to that, make sure you do because there's loads going on at the moment. We need to carry on talking about interest rate cuts or the potential of interest rate cuts. Because as we reported last week, there now seems to be an expectation that the Bank of England are going to cut interest rates. And that, Rob, is not a surprise to me. What is a surprise to me is how strongly the market now feels that this is going to happen. Because in this report by Sky News, it says that market bets are at 98% that there will be a rate cut in November. 98%. I mean, it's not 100, so it's not nailed on. But wow, that's as close to nailed on as you can get. It's like almost don't bother with the committee meeting. It's going to happen. So besides possibly for savers, that is great news for a lot of people. A cut of 0.25%. Now, we have to remember that markets can change. There's a lot of global influences at the moment that could put upward pressures on inflation, like oil potentially going up in price. But as it stands today, Rob, it looks like that we could have another rate cut, which I'd certainly take. Yeah, likewise. But confusingly, though, there's also been a story in the BBC this week that says fresh rise in mortgage rates predicted. So that sounds a bit odd. Everyone thinks that rates are going to come down, but mortgages could go up. What's going on there? The answer is, of course, generally, that fixed-term mortgages are forward-looking. They're looking at the cost of borrowing over the two, three, or five years, whatever it is. So any expectations about what might happen in the future are already priced in. But even so, I find it surprising that comments from the Bank of England about being more aggressive haven't changed those expectations about borrowing costs over the longer term. Maybe they just need to see a sign of it happening before there are moves. But irrespective of all that, for anyone who is on a tracker product, definitely good news because that's going to be getting passed straight through. And I know from the people who we speak to and from looking at some of the data that far more people than usual have been taking out tracker products over the past couple of years. It seems very likely that those people are going to get some welcome news in November and possibly December as well because the Bank of England has two more meetings this year. So we could see a double rate cut, Rob. That would surprise me, even as a great optimist. I just can't see a double cut, but then anything could happen. So we will see. And of course, we will keep you updated with the news stories that we do every week and more in depth with our market updates each and every month. Before we go on to the very exciting episode that we have this week, just a quick thank you to all our wonderful Property Hub Select members who made our meetup last week. It was great to see loads of people in person. Rob, you did a special reveal and Q&A on your book. We also got to do a bit of a market Q&A as well, which I very much enjoyed. So thank you, everyone who has got involved. Great to see some of our community there. And if you are thinking, what on earth is Property Hub Select? And how can I get involved? Well, it is for our investors, our clients that we work with. If you'd like to potentially work with us in the future, see if what we do is right for you. Go to propertyhub.net forward slash invest. That's propertyhub.net forward slash invest where you can find out about all the things we do there and find out more about Property Hub Select as well. So Rob, I'm very excited for you. For the first time to our podcast audience, you've been teasing this book for a little while now, but the teasing is over because today we're doing more than just mentioning that your book is coming out, but actually we're giving content away from that book. But let's do the big reveal. What is this book called and what is it about? So... Finally, I can say this book is called Seven Myths About Money. And the idea of the book is most people listening to the show will have read a personal finance book or two in the past. For most people, this isn't going to be the first book of this type that they've read. But when you go and actually dig into the personal finance advice, the things that you hear, the stuff that you just take for granted because it's what people have always told you, most of it is over 100 years old. 
And some of it is still valid. I'm not saying we throw out everything, but it originates in a completely different world. So in this book, as the name suggests, I pick out seven myths, things that you hear all the time, things people tell you about what you should do with your money, how it works, all this kind of stuff, where the traditional advice just doesn't work anymore. So for each of these myths, what it is you've probably been told, why that doesn't work for the economic world that we're in now, but then most importantly, what you should actually do about it, what you can do instead. So this is hopefully an interesting book, but it's also a super practical book. I hope that this is going to be a book that not just opens people's eyes to a lot of things, but also helps them end up with a plan about what to do with their money that makes sense, that they feel confident in, that they feel excited about. So while my last book was about, here's how the financial world works, and it's probably going to collapse, sorry, (laughs) this new book is a far more positive and practical one. So I'm so excited to have this out there. I am. I'm super excited. It's also fresh and new that the printing press hasn't even started yet. So I'm looking forward to that happening, Rob. But you are giving value away from day one. This book will be tremendous value when people purchase it, I have no doubt, because every other book you've put together has been tremendous value. It often feels like an unfair trade, the price you're paying for the book for the information you're getting. But we're going to do one of those unfair trades again, because this podcast is free. (laughs) Yeah, We're going to give away one of the key myths from the book. And it's going to be a myth, I think, that a lot of people in the podcast will quickly get hold of and grasp, because it's stuff that We've talked about a little bit on the podcast, but the book really builds on it, and I really like that. And this is the too risky myth. Obviously, there are seven myths in the book, and one of the myths is that doing anything more than just put money into an ISA or a SIP or a savings account is too risky. Doing more than that is too risky, and most people should stay away from doing anything more than that. But you say, Rob, no, that's not actually the case. If you want above average results, you have to take some risk. You do. And I won't bore on about it now, but a point that comes across in the book is that the average is getting worse. So there are things that you can do to achieve the average. But for someone coming of age in the 70s, like the average was really pretty good. Now, not so much in the future, even worse. So if you want the average, cool, there's ways of doing that. But if you want to do better than that, you have to take some risks. And there's a really interesting disconnect, Rob, when you read books like The Richest Man in Babylon and things like that. How are you told to get rich? Well, you're told to diversify. That's really important. You're told not to take risks. You want to avoid losing money. You don't want to blow yourself up. And you're supposed to just wait, let compounding work its magic, and everything will be okay. But then you look at how people actually get rich. You and I both know people who are seriously well off. How did they do it? Did they do it like that? No, they didn't. They started a business and went all in on it. There was no diversification at all. They've used debt. Using debt is riskier than not using debt. They use debt in property projects or for their business. And they've made bets on individual assets. They haven't just bought the tracker fund. They've picked something that they see potential in. They've pushed all their chips into it and it's paid off. You're right, Rob. And I don't think you're saying like, don't do diversification and take advantage of compounding. It's not to say don't do that. That's like the first step, but that's no longer enough anymore. So it is good doing that compared to doing nothing because most people will do nothing. And that's why I think as a base level, it's a step in the right direction. But people used to stop there and still do stop there. I think that's it. My job's done. But as you're rightly pointing out, you need to take that next step if you want to get rich or wealthy, however you like to define it. But That is key. No longer that one step is enough. That's right. There's a section in the book that I've got the heading, to be comfortable, diversify, to get rich, focus. So there's a difference between being comfortable, and you can certainly get there by playing it safe if you've got time on your side. That's a separate point, but that takes time. But if you want to be rich, then you've got to focus in a bit and you've got to take some calculated risk. And as you've said, Rob, not everyone wants to do that. If you give people the choice, say, would you like a ton of money or not? Most people will take the ton of money, but the trade-off might not be worth it. Because one of the points that I make is that for the type of investment that is going to significantly affect your wealth, not just make you a little bit richer every year until in 30 years time, you're doing pretty well. But anything that's going to make a significant difference is going to involve time, it's going to involve some degree of risk, and it's going to involve your attention or skill. So this isn't just something where you can buy into the index fund and forget about it. That's something you can have done as well. But if you want the investment that makes a difference, risk, time, and developing skills or giving it your attention, to some people, that's just not going to be worth it. And something that 
I emphasize that's actually really hard to do is to be honest about yourself. Is this something you want to do? You kind of need to understand if you do want to be rich, what does that involve? What are the trade-offs? And is that something that you're comfortable doing? You touched on being comfortable, Rob, and comfortable is cool. The word comfortable is a nice word, and most people will not be financially comfortable in their lives. And the thought of starting up a business and building it out could be intimidating for some people, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can take risk in a calculated way. And that's something you talk about in the book, and it's managing your downside with that risk. Because some things, like a business, can be, doesn't have to be, but can be all or nothing. Or a big property venture can be, if it goes wrong, all or nothing. So there are ways of getting towards what you've outlined in the book without putting everything on the line. Yeah, it comes down to managing your downsides. Most people don't want to be taking risks with 100% of their net worth. Some people do. Some people are comfortable with that. Some people are maniacs and that's okay. And some people have life situations where they can afford to take risks as well. There's a whole other section in the book about what type of people or in what stages in your life you can maybe should be taking more risk about how some of the sort of seemingly irrational bets that you see people making when they're younger might not be irrational after all. But for most people, the way to manage risk is to not take risk with everything you've got. In the book, I talk about three different buckets. Basically, everyone, when they invest in anything, has three goals. They want to protect themselves. So that's where things like an emergency fund come in. They want to maintain their lifestyle, even after they finished working. And they want to improve their lifestyle, which is the kind of thing we're talking about in this episode. Everyone wants all three of those things to some degree. There are no exceptions. Everybody has all three of these motivations all the time but we have them in different proportions. Some people are mostly interested in protecting themselves. That's what makes them feel good. That's just what they're drawn towards. And yeah, they'd like to improve, but maybe that's just like a 5% thing. It's not something that they're that focused on. Other people, very much the opposite. So the point is, if you divide your investments into these three buckets and you size them up correctly, then you can afford to take risks because you're not going to blow yourself up completely. So you can take a chance on the riskier stuff that's got the potential for paying off big, but maybe you're only doing that with... 10%, 20% of your net worth, and the rest is dedicated to protecting and maintaining. Some people, like I said, will be wanting to take next to no risk if they're quite happy where they are. Other people will be going like, well, actually, I haven't got that much to lose, and I'm happy backing myself to bounce back if it all goes wrong. So I'm going to chuck almost everything at making the big bets. Something else you've outlined in the book, Rob, and this makes me chuckle because this is something we've got really right in the past but also really wrong, is investing where you have an advantage. Because our biggest wins have been when we focused on what we're good at and where we have an advantage, and our biggest financial losses have come when we strayed away from that. I'm glad your life lessons have made it into the book as well. (laughs) Yeah, some of what's in the book is uh, hard-won knowledge. Let's say that way, knowledge that probably won't be, when financial losses associated with this knowledge, it probably won't be recouped from the book, but that's okay. The point is, There is a big difference between investing and gambling, which I don't think is always clear to people. A lot of people have a strong drive to be in a significantly better position than they are now, and they recognise that they need to do something to get them there. But what you see them doing, what we saw a lot of people doing a couple of years ago, was getting into the more speculative side of crypto, or you see them getting into get-rich-quick schemes, and that is largely gambling. That's where you've got some chance of it really paying off for you, a large chance of it not paying off but it's pretty much outside your control. It's chance whether it works or not. Investing is deliberately picking something where you have an above average chance of success. You can't guarantee the outcome. Of course you can't, but you can shift the odds in your favor. And when we talk about an above average chance of success, Rob, what can you do to shift those odds in your favor? A lot of it comes down to knowledge, right? I'm not talking about like knowledge of someone gives you a stock tip. I'm talking about like deep knowledge of a particular asset or a particular sector that you develop over time. Yeah, this part of the book, Rob, really speaks to me because of that direct experience, both the wins and the pain. It's the pain that sticks around longer. But luckily, there have been successes as well. To give examples, one of the things that I've done on a fairly regular basis, when I've seen the share price of house builders, it's a bit of a low because maybe of a worldwide event. But I have felt the market was in a strong, resilient place and help to buy was in place, I was like, that's like a government grant. So for me, it was a no-brainer to assess house builders as an option to invest in 
every time they took a hammer in because I felt I had an inside track, if you like, all above board and legal, but an inside track to kind of what was going on in the market. That's my game, right? Your game too. So having that insight and that expertise in that market helped me make a lot of what turned out to be good bets or good investments, maybe a better word, because that's what they turned out to be. And I've repeated that model on multiple occasions. And if you're listening to this, what sector do you know inside out more than the market knows? Remember, the market isn't an expert in every sector. It's a generalist. The market's a generalist. And when the market moves, normally everything moves. But has every sector been hammered when all shares take a hammering? No. So if you understand your sector every time there's big movements with shares, then you may be able to take advantage of that. Another obvious example, Rob, is starting a business where you've seen the model work. Property Hub Invest was based on a version of a place I'd worked previously. Now, it was very different, and I took what I liked about that place and what I didn't like and decided that they are things I will never, ever do. And nothing dodgy. It was more about how people were treated and things like that. But I understood the rough concept of the model because I'd worked within a business like that. And then we ended up innovating and being actually quite different after even just a few years in. But it gave me the confidence to start because I understood the principle of the model. And that gave me an advantage there as well. Exactly. So to tie back to this myth of things being too risky, yeah, investments can be too risky, but they can be a whole lot less risky and it can be worth it if you first of all cap your downside by sizing up the bet that you're going to make and then investing where you have an advantage and those are two great examples that you've just given this is of course the property podcast in case you're wondering property does fit into this property is the type of investment that can over time make you rich whereas some people see property as too risky let's see where property fits into this so when i went and studied the types of investment that have the potential to make you rich they basically all have at least one of three different characteristics So the first is concentration. This is the opposite of spreading your bets. If you spread your bets, by definition, you're going to get the average result. That's just how it works. So you have to be concentrated. The second characteristic is human capital. So if you start a business, that counts using your skills in some kind of way. Any investment you make that is going to have a high chance of paying off, it's going to take some of your time. It's going to take some of your knowledge. There's no getting away from it. So you've got concentration, human capital, and finally, leverage. Leverage can be operational. So starting a business gives you leverage because you start the business, you have ownership of the business, but you bring in other people to do some of the work and allow you to serve more people, have wider reach, ultimately make more money. That's operational leverage. But there's also financial leverage. And of course, Rob, this is where property fits in. I feel like we come back to leverage a lot, but that's because it's so important. You can apply leverage to businesses. You can apply leverage to a portfolio of shares if you really want to. But for most people, most of the time, those things are not a good idea. Property, though, is the perfect asset for leverage because of its lack of volatility. People are comfortable applying leverage in the form of a mortgage to property. And because leverage is one of those three characteristics, it can make a huge difference. It can. And we've talked extensively about leverage on this podcast and we've talked about it on YouTube as well. So we'll put some links in the show notes. But a quick reminder just how powerful this is. So if you take your money and let's say you have £400,000, you could buy one property for four hundred, or you could go and buy four properties and you put 25% down on each one. So instead of having one that's 400. You have four, that's 400. So suddenly you have £1.6 million worth of property instead of £400,000 worth of property. That's pretty cool, right? i tell you what's even cooler, when it goes up by 5%. Because if your property of 400000 goes up by 5% in terms of capital growth, then you've made £20,000. Not bad. But when you leverage, that's suddenly multiplied and it becomes £80,000. So you've put the same amount of money in, but you've got a 20% return instead of a 5% return because of leverage. Now, I can already hear the people going, well, it can also go against you the other way, but yes, you only lose when you sell, and we know that property goes up over the long term. That's pretty much historic fact. I can't promise you the future, but that's what's happened for the last several hundred years. And the second is, yes, you do have some transaction costs, so it's not as simple as I've just laid out. However, The concept is 
the important thing here. So don't let the details get in the way of what is a super powerful, incredible tool that actually makes property worthwhile. Without it, it makes property as an investment a bit average, for being completely honest. It's leverage that really supercharges it. Yes, it's average, it's fine, it's okay. But when you introduce leverage into property, that's when it becomes spectacular. That's when it becomes really exciting. Yeah, exactly. And is it more risky than buying with cash? Yeah, of course it is. But is it too risky? This is the point. So lots of people will just blindly go, oh, property's too risky. It's illiquid. It's hard to sell. I know so-and-so who bought an off-plan flat in Bulgaria and lost a load of money. Everyone's got these ideas about property being too risky. And again, it all comes down to the person, right? So for some people, it will be too risky. It'll involve more risk than they want to take. It'll involve more time than they need to put in. Because remember, to control your risk, you need to build your knowledge. But is it too risky for many people? In my opinion, if you do it in an educated and intelligent and sensible way, for many people, it's not as risky as it first seems. Because of course, when you use leverage, when you take out a mortgage, you've got two principal risks. One risk as you've said, Rob, is it moves against you. So it magnifies your returns to the upside and also to the downside. But as you also said, you only lock it in when you sell. There's a chance that if the property market crashes and you're a negative equity, the bank tries and comes to repossess. But as we saw in 2008, that's really not that likely because they're not going to want to repossess everyone at the same time. If you're in that position, hundreds of thousands of other people will also be in that position what are they going to do with hundreds of thousands of houses? It's just not their model. So a market crash is actually not that risky. Your risk is you individually doing something stupid and getting into trouble. The market is less of a problem as long as you can hold on. That takes us into the second risk of having a mortgage, which is that you can't cover your costs. You're unable to make your mortgage payments. And as a result, the bank ends up taking the property back off you. And yes, of course, that is a risk that you need to control with cash reserves and insurance and any other measure that you feel necessary. Linked to that is the risk that your payments go up. So mortgage rates suddenly spike. So you were able to cover your costs at the rate that you borrowed at. Then suddenly your payments have doubled and you can't afford it anymore. That's a risk that a lot of people have experienced recently, in fact, because as we know, interest rates went up by about 250%. But funnily enough, that now means that the risk is lower because when the base rate was practically zero, there was a certainty that it was going to go up at some point. Of course it was, but now it's around 5%. Could it go up from here? Yeah, of course it could. But is it going to go up by another 250% from here? No, I'd say it's virtually impossible without crashing absolutely everything. So that risk still exists, but that risk is lower than it once was. So I need to point out, Rob, that this isn't an entire book that brings you around to the conclusion of you should invest in property. Talk about many other ways of doing things as well. Some people are just not into property. It's not their thing. That is totally fine. I think investing in what you're excited about and what you're comfortable with is really important as well. But for the purposes of the property podcast, I think this is an amazing demonstration of taking one of those characteristics of an investment that can make you rich, which is leverage, just works out so well. It does. And don't worry, Rob, I don't think any of those people are listening. <laughs> if you are, you're a nutter. Good like, point, yeah. There are all the podcasts <laughs> Have you been this far in? <laughs> <laughs> we do recommendations at Christmas. Come back for that episode. We'll guide you in the right direction. <laughs> but for the 99.9% of everyone else listening to this point, it's just reassuring that, yes, some people may look at what you do as risky, but it's calculated risks. And with calculated, informed risks you can do incredibly well. Just doing the normal, as we talked about at the beginning of this pod, will get you comfortable. It's taking the step to invest in property with some leverage that will take you from comfortable to wealthy or rich, depending on what you want to be. But it does require some time and it does require some risk. And that's okay, as long as it's informed risk, which hopefully with this podcast, makes you informed. Yeah, one episode's not going to get you there, but most of you have been listening for more than one episode and most of you are signed up to Property Pulse and most of you are consuming YouTube and everything else and Rob's book. So with all of that, it makes you an informed investor. That gives you that inside track. It gives you that advantage. So take advantage of your advantage and continue to invest with leverage and you will reap the rewards. But Rob, people can reap the rewards of your book, which is our obvious hub extra choice this week and you're very pleased to announce i'm sure that you can finally allow people to purchase the book the book's not coming out until january but you've got a link that allows people to pre-order and why would you not want to kick your year off in style with this book landing on your doorstep so rob come on give us it what is the link i want to get there now 
Yep, you can go over to sevenmythsaboutmoney.com. You can spell it S-E-V-E-N. You can spell it with a number seven. I've thought of this. It redirects. So you go to sevenmythsaboutmoney.com and you can pre-order the book there. It's available as hardback, Kindle and audiobook. And even though it won't land with you till the 9th of January, if you do pre-order, I'll instantly send you a chapter of the book that you can get stuck into straight away. And there are some bonuses as well, which I won't go on about now, but you'll see them if you go to that page. I think it makes a very strong argument for pre-ordering rather than waiting until January. So we'll leave the link in the show notes, but sevenmythsaboutmoney.com. But if you spell it M-I-F-S, then that's not going to redirect. We can't help you then. You're going to have to try it again. <laughs> I haven't thought of that one. No. <laughs> I haven't accounted for your spelling, Rob. I'll have to go and buy that one as well. Hey! <laughs> right. <laughs> Rob, super pleased that we've got to this point. I know how many, many, many months you've been working on this book. So congratulations. It's a nice moment to finally allow people to pre-order. And I'm really grateful that you're bringing the concept to the podcast as well so we can share it with our amazing community. And I hope you listening feel that way too. So please do get the book because I think you're going to benefit from it tremendously. But if not, just get it to support Rob D because I think after all these years of giving away free education and knowledge, buying a book in return, not a bad trade. You know what else is not a bad trade? Giving a little bit of your time for another podcast, which of course we will deliver on Tuesday with Ask Rob and Rob. But before then, we will appear in the Sunday Times in the home section, answering more of your questions there. So there's loads and loads of content going out. And of course, go and check out our YouTube channel, search for Property Hub UK. So lots to keep you busy with until we return next week with another podcast. So until then, take care, have fun. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.